Hello and welcome to General Astronomy Lecture 10, Introduction to Planetary Geology. It's easy to take for granted the qualities that make Earth so suitable for human life. A temperature neither boiling nor freezing, abundant water, a protective atmosphere, and a relatively stable environment. But we need to look only as far as our neighboring terrestrial worlds to see how fortunate we really are. The moon is airless and barren, and Mercury is much the same. Venus is a searing hothouse, while Mars has an atmosphere that's so thin and cold that liquid water cannot last on its surface today. How did the terrestrial worlds come to be so different, and why did Earth alone develop condi uh, conditions to permit life on its surface? We'll explore these questions th through careful, comparative studies of the planets focusing on the geology of the terrestrial worlds in this lecture, and we will see... Um, Later on, the histories of the terrestrial worlds uh, have been determined largely by properties that were endowed at their births. And then uh, we'll also talk about the atmospheres of these planets as well in a coming lecture. So, Earth's surface seems solid and steady, but every so often it offers us a reminder that nothing about it is permanent. If you live in either Alaska or California, you've probably felt the ground shift beneath you in an earthquake. In fact, we have quite a few minor ones here in Oklahoma. In Washington state, you have probably witnessed the rumbling of Mount St. Helens. Uh, in Hawaii, a visit to the active Kaleo volcano will remind you that you are standing on a mountain of volcanic rock protruding from the ocean's floor. Volcanoes and earthquakes are not the only processes acting to reshape Earth's surface. They are not even the most dramatic. Far greater change can occur on rare occasion when an asteroid or a comet slams into Earth. More gradual processes can also have spectacular effects. The Colorado River causes only small changes in the landscape from year to year, but its unrelenting flow over the past few million years carved the Grand Canyon. The Rocky Mountains were once twice as tall as they are today, but they have been cut down in size through tens of millions of years of erosion by wind, rain, and snow. Entire continents even move slowly about, completely rearranging the map of Earth every few hundred million years. Earth is not alone in having underground, or undergone tremendous change since its birth. The surfaces of all five terrestrial worlds, that being Mercury, Venus, Earth, the Moon, and Mars, have looked uh, much similar when they were. They looked much similar when they were young. All five were made of rocky material that condensed in the solar nebula, and all five were subjected to early uh, impacts of the Great um, Bombardment. The significant differences in their present-day appearance must therefore be the result of changes that have occurred through time. Ultimately, these changes must be traceable to fundamental properties of the planets. So, this figure shows global views of the terrestrial surfaces to scale as well as samples of their surface views from orbit. Profound differences among these worlds are immediately obvious. Mercury and the Moon show the scars of their battering during the heavy bombardment. In that sense, they are densely covered by craters, and um, there are regions where you see volcanic plains as well. So these flat, uh, what we call highlands, which we'll talk about soon. Bizarre bulges and odd volcanoes dot the surface of Venus, Mars, despite its middling size, has the solar system's largest volcanoes and a huge canyon cutting across its surface, along with numerous features that appear to have been shaped by liquid water. Earth has surface features similar to all of the other terrestrial worlds and more, including a unique layer of living, or living or organisms that covers almost the entire surface of the planet, which we call the biosphere. Our goal in this uh, lecture is to understand how these differences among the terrestrial planets came to be, uh, and this type of study is what we call planetary geology. All the terrestrial worlds have layered interiors. We divide the interiors into three layers according to density. First, we have the core, the centralmost region. This is the high density material consisting primarily of metals such as nickel and iron that resides in the central core, or the center of the planet. Next, we have the mantle, which is rocky material of moderate density. Uh, it's mostly minerals that contain silicon, oxygen, and other elements that forms uh, the thick mantle that surrounds the core. Beyond that, we have the crust. 
This is the low density rock region, which consists of uh, rocks uh, along the likes of granite and basalt, uh, which are uh, basalt is a common form of volcanic rock. Um, that forms the thin crust, which is es essentially representing the world's outer skin. So this figure here is very important. It shows the layers for the five terrestrial worlds. Although not shown, Earth's metallic core actually consists of two distinct regions, a solid inner core and a molten or liquid outer core. Venus may have a similar core structure, but without seismic data, we cannot be sure. We can understand why the interiors are layered by thinking about what happens in a mixture of oil and water. Gravity pulls the denser water to the bottom, driving the less dense oil to the top, in a process known as differentiation because it results in different layers of different materials. The layered interiors of terrestrial worlds tell us what, that they underwent differentiation at some time in the past, which means all of these worlds must have once been hot enough inside for their internal rock and metal to melt, which was during formation. Dense materials like iron sank toward the center, which drove the less dense rocky materials toward the surface. So. You'll notice a lot of interesting features here, and this is another one of those images that's good to reference uh, if you ever need it. Um, but you'll see that, for example, Mercury has a really large core compared to the rest of its um, uh, uh, interior. And then the Moon is kind of the opposite. It has a very, very small core compared to the rest of its uh, internal um, structure. So we're going to learn a little bit about how all of these things came about. So, um, comparing the terrestrial world's interiors provides important clues about their early histories. Models indicate that the relative proportions of metal and rock should have been similar throughout the inner solar system at the time that they formed, which means we should expect smaller worlds to have correspondingly smaller metal cores. We do indeed see this general pattern in the figure on the previous slide, but as I mentioned, it's not perfect. Mercury's core seems surprisingly big, while the Moon's core seems surprisingly small. These surprises are a major reason scientists suspect that giant impacts affected both of those worlds. In Mercury's case, a giant impact that blasted away its outer rocky layers while leaving its core intact could explain why the core is so large compared to the rest of the planet. We can explain the Moon's small core by assuming that the Moon formed from debris blasted out of the Earth's rocky outer layers. The debris would have contained relatively little high-density material and therefore would have accreted into an object with a small metal core. So you can see an example of those two again pulled up here. In terms of rock strength, a planet's outer layer consists of relatively cool and rigid rock called the lithosphere, where lithos is Greek for stone, that essentially floats on the warmer, softer rock beneath. As shown by the dashed circles in the previous figures, the lithosphere encompasses the crust and part of the mantle of each world. Notice that lithospheric thickness is closely related to a world's size. Smaller worlds tend to have thicker, uh, thicker li lithospheres. Excuse me. The two largest terrestrial planets, that being Earth and Venus, have thin lithospheres that extend only a short way into their upper mantles. The smaller worlds, Mars, Mercury, and the Moon, have thick lithospheres that extend nearly to their cores. The thickness of the lithosphere is very important to geology. A thin lithosphere is brittle and can break easily, while a thick lithosphere is much stronger and inhibits the passage of molten rock from below, making volcanic eruptions and the formation of mountain ranges less likely. So if you want to go back, you can see this. So the lithosphere is defined by the dashed line in the region from the surface to the end of the dashed line. So again, for Earth and Venus, we have small lithospheres, but for the other planets, uh, well, and the Moon, the lithosphere extends almost all the way to the core. And we'll learn about how that happens later on. The fact that rock can deform and flow also explains why large worlds are spherical, while small moons and asteroids are more potato-shaped or uh, randomly shaped. The weak gravity of a small object is unable to overcome the rigidity of its rocky material, so the object retains its shape it had when it was born. For a larger world, 
gravity can overcome the strength of solid rock, and slowly deforms and molds it into a spherical shape. Gravity will make any rocky object bigger than about 500 kilometers in diameter into a sphere within about a billion years. Larger worlds become spherically more quickly, especially if they are molten or gaseous at some point in their history. The most interesting aspects of planetary geology are those that cause the surfaces of the terrestrial worlds to change with time. We use the term geological activity to describe ongoing changes. For example, we say the Earth is geologically active because volcanoes, uh, earthquakes, erosion, and other geological processes are continually reshaping its surface. In contrast, however, the Moon and Mercury have virtually no geological activity, which is why their surfaces today look essentially the same as they did billions of years ago. Interior heat is the primary driver of geological activity. For example, volcanoes can erupt only if the interior is hot enough to melt at least some rock into molten lava. But what makes some planetary interiors hotter than others? Well, to find the answer, we must investigate how interiors heat up and cool off. As we'll see, we can ultimately trace a planet's internal heat, and hence its geological activity, back to its size. So size is the key here. So before we get into the uh, details of that, let's take a look at both of these types of processes. The heating processes first, and then we'll look at how planets cool. A hot interior contains a lot of thermal energy, and the law of conservation of energy tells us that this energy must come from somewhere. Although you might first guess that the sun would be the heat source, this is not the case. Sunlight is the primary heat source for the surfaces of the terrestrial planets, but virtually none of this solar energy penetrates more than a few meters into the ground. Internal heating is a product of the planets themselves, not of the sun. Three sources of energy explain nearly all the interior heat of the terrestrial worlds. First, we have heat of accretion. So accretion deposits energy brought in from afar by colliding planetesimals. As a planetesimal approaches a forming planet, its gravitational energy is converted into kinetic energy, which causes it to accelerate. So basically, it accelerates as it gets nearby. Upon impact, much of that kinetic energy is then converted into heat, adding to the thermal energy of the planet. The next is heat from differentiation. So we've been talking now a couple times of the process of differentiation where heavy material sinks to the bottom and lighter material floats to the top. Well, when a world undergoes differentiation, the sinking of dense material and rising of less dense material means that mass moves inward, losing gravitational potential energy. This energy is converted into thermal energy by the friction generated as material separates by density. So basically you have material moving up, some moving down, they are rubbing past each other, and just like if you were to rub your hands together right now, you would feel them warm up a bit. So that friction generates uh, some of that heating. The same thing happens when you drop a brick into a pool. As the brick sinks to the bottom, friction with the surrounding water heats the pool. Though, of course, the amount of heat from a single brick is far too small to be noticed. And then the last here is heat from radioactive decay. So, the rock and metal that builds the terrestrial worlds, we know now, contains radioactive isotopes of elements such as uranium, potassium, and thorium. When radioactive nuclei decay, subatomic particles fly off at high speeds, colliding with neighboring atoms and heating them. So, the combination of the three heat sources explains how the terrestrial interiors ended up with the core mantle crust structures. The many violent impacts that occurred during the later stages of accretion deposited so much energy that the outer layers of the young planets began, began to melt. This started the process of differentiation, which then released its own additional heat. This heat, along with the substantial heat from early radioactive decay, made the interiors hot enough to melt and differentiate throughout. All right, so those are the three heating processes. We also have three cooling processes. Cooling a planetary interior requires transporting heat outward. Just as there are three basic heating processes for planetary interiors, there are also three basic cooling processes. The first is convection. Convection is the process by which hot material expands and rises while cooler material contracts and falls. It therefore transfers heat upward and can occur whenever there is a strong heating from below. 
you can see convection in a pot of soup or a pot of boiling water on a hot burner. And you may be familiar with it in weather. Warm air near the ground tends to rise while cool air above tends to fall. Next we have conduction. Conduction is the transfer of heat from hot material to a cool material through contact. It is operating when a hot potato transfers its heat to your cooler hand when you pick it up. Conduction occurs through the microscopic collisions of individual atoms or molecules. Molecules of materials in close contact are constantly colliding with one another. So the faster moving molecules in the hot material tend to transfer some of their energy to the slower moving materials of the cooler material. I meant the slower moving molecules of the cooler material, excuse me. And then the third cooling process is radiation. Planets ultimately lose heat to space through radiation. Remember that objects emit thermal radiation characteristic of their temperatures. This radiation, which often is light, carries energy away and therefore cools an object. Because of their relatively low temperatures, planets radiate primarily in the infrared. So this is something we'll learn about in a couple lectures from now. Um, but there's more than just visible light, there's infrared, ultraviolet, and so on. So planets radiate mostly in infrared, which is why we don't see it. For Earth, convection is the most important heat process in the interior. Hot rock from deep within the mantle gradually rises, slowly cooling as it makes its way upward. By the time it reaches the top of the mantle, the rock has transferred its excess heat to its surroundings, so it is now cool and begins to fall back down. This ongoing process creates individual convection cells within the mantle, shown as small circles in this figure here, uh, with arrows indicating the direction of flow. Mantle convection stops at the base of the lithosphere, where the rock is too strong to flow as readily as it does lower down. From the base of the lithosphere to the surface, heat continues upward primarily through conduction, although some heat also reaches the surface through volcanic eruptions that directly carry the hot rock upward. When heat finally reaches the Earth's surface, it then is radiated away into space. So I told you a moment ago that all of this comes back to size of the planet, to the size of the planet. So we'll look at that a little bit now. Size is the single most important factor in planetary cooling. Just as a hot potato remains hot inside much longer than a hot pea, a large planet can stay hot inside much longer than a smaller one. You can see why size is the critical factor by picturing a large planet and uh, by picturing a large planet as a smaller planet wrapped in extra layers of rock. Those extra layers of rock act as an insulation, so it takes much longer for interior heat to reach the surface. Size is therefore the primary factor in determining geological activity. The relatively small sizes of the Moon and Mercury probably allowed for their interiors to cool within a billion years or so after they formed. As they cooled, their lithospheres thickened and mantle convection was confined to deeper and deeper layers. Ultimately, the mantle convection probably stopped altogether. With insufficient internal heat to drive any further movement of interior rock, the Moon and Mercury are now considered geologically dead meaning that they have little or no heat-driven heat driven geological activity today. In contrast, the much larger size of Earth has allowed our planet to stay quite hot on the inside. Mantle convection keeps interior rock in motion, and the heat keeps the lithosphere thin, which is why geological activity can continually reshape the surface. Venus probably remains nearly as active as Earth, thanks to its very similar size. Mars, with a size between those of the other terrestrial worlds, probably represents an intermediate case. It has cooled significantly during its history, but it is probably still warm enough to, re uh, to retain some of its internal heat for at least some geological activity. Interior heat plays another important role. It can help uh, create a global magnetic field. Earth's magnetic field determines the direction in which a compass needle points, but it also plays many other important roles. The magnetic field helps create a magnetosphere that surrounds our planet and diverts the paths of high-energy charged particles coming in from the Sun. 
The magnetic field therefore protects Earth's atmosphere from being stripped away into space by the solar particles. Many scientists suspect that this protection has been crucial to the long-term ability, I'm sorry, habitability of Earth, and hence to our own existence. So it's really amazing. Uh, there's charged particles coming from the sun, but we have a magnetic field around the Earth, that in, invisible, what I would consider a force field in the simplest of terms. There's this invisible field around us that basically diverts any of this charged particles coming from the sun. If we did not have this, those charged particles would just smash into our atmospheric particles and start to strip away our own atmosphere. So we're lucky that we have this magnetic field. So let's dive into this a little bit further to see how it works. You are probably familiar with the pattern of the magnetic field created by an uh, iron bar, so this image here on the right. So there's a magnet here with a north and south pole, it's a bar magnet. And you might have seen this in demos and stuff before, maybe in another course or maybe somewhere online. Um, but if you sprinkle iron filings around the magnet, you'll see them align in this interesting pattern. It's this looping pattern from north to south. So um, that's a common view of a magnetic field. You can't see it with your own eyes, but if you sprinkle some iron filings, they align with those field lines. Well, Earth's magnetic field is generated by a process more like that of an electromagnet in which the magnetic field arises from a battery that forces charged particles, that being electrons, to move along a coiled wire. So you can see this here. This is a battery just hooked up to some wire, and if you wrap the wire into a loop, it will create a magnetic field that creates a similar looping structure. Now, I won't go into the physics of this. Uh, my Physics 2 class does go into a lot of detail about how uh, this electric current can create a magnetic field and things like that. Um, but for our course here in astronomy, we'll ignore a lot of the physics. But the point is, a battery hooked up to a coil of wire does produce a magnetic field shown by the pink lines. So, um, Earth does not contain a battery. I mean, we've, we've kind of been able to tell so far. But charged particles move with the molten material in its liquid outer core. So we do have a liquid outer core, which means there is the motion of charged particles. Internal heat causes the liquid metal to rise and fall via convection, while Earth's rotation twists and distorts, distorts this convection pattern. The result is that electrons in the molten metal move within Earth's outer core in much the same way that they move in an electromagnet, generating Earth's magnetic field. So, although in the top we needed a battery, the, the reason that a magnetic field is created was the motion of charged particles. Well, we have a liquid core with charged particles moving around. So in much the same way, we generate a giant magnetic field around the Earth. We can generalize these ideas in uh, to other worlds. There are three basic requirements for a global magnetic field. First, an interior region of electrically conducting fluid, that being liquid or gas, such as molten metal, so, right? So you need a region of some kind of liquid or gaseous metal. Um, convection in that layer of fluid must also occur, so it needs to be moving. And we also need a moderately rapid rotation, so just the convection alone isn't going to generate that magnetic field. We need that twisting and distorting caused by the rotation as well. So Earth is the only terrestrial world that meets all three requirements, which is why it is the only terrestrial world with a strong magnetic field. The moon has no magnetic field, presumably because its core has long since cooled and ceased convecting. Mars's core probably still retains some heat, but not enough to drive uh, core convection, which is why it also lacks a magnetic field today. Venus probably has a molten core layer much like that of Earth, but either its convection or its 243-day rotation period is too slow to actually generate that magnetic field. Mercury, however, remains an enigma. It possesses a measurable magnetic field, despite its small size and slow 59-day rotation. The reason for this may be Mercury's huge metal core, which may still be partially molten and convecting. The same three requirements for a magnetic field also apply to Jovian planets and stars. For example, Jupiter's strong magnetic field comes from its ro rapid rotation and its layers of convecting metallic hydrogen that conducts electricity. 
The sun's magnetic field is generated by the combination of convection and ionized gas, or plasma, in its interior and its rotation. Now that we have discussed how Earth and other terrestrial worlds work on the inside, we are ready to turn to their surfaces. Surface features tell us a great deal about the histories of the planets. Although we find a huge variety of geological surface features on Earth and the other terrestrial worlds, nearly all of them can be explained by just four geological processes. First, impact cratering. The creation of bowl-shaped impact craters by asteroids or comets striking a planet's surface. Second, by volcanism. The eruption of molten rock or lava from a planet's interior onto its surface. Third, tectonics, this, the disruption or, uh, of a planet's surface by internal stresses. And fourth, erosion, the wearing down or building up of geological features by wind, water, ice, and other phenomena of planetary weather. So these four things together can shape the surface of a planet. So we'll break each one of them down. Oops. First, we had impact cratering. The scarred faces of the Moon and Mercury attest to the battering that the terrestrial worlds have taken from leftover planetesimals such as comets and asteroids. They also immediately reveal an important feature of impact craters. Small craters far outnumber large ones, confirming that many more small asteroids and comets orbiting the Sun uh, than large ones. While the Moon and Mercury bear the most obvious scars, all of the terrestrial worlds have suffered similar impacts. An impact crater forms when an asteroid or comet slams into a solid surface. Impacting objects typically hit the surface at a speed between about 10,000 and, 7, I'm sorry, 10, and 70,000 meters per second. At such tremendous speeds, the impact uh, releases enough energy to vaporize solid rock and blast out a crater. Uh, which is a Greek word for cup. Debris from the blast shoots high above the surface and then rains down over a large area. If the impact is large enough, some of the ejected material can escape into space. And you can see a little graphical representation of this here. So we have an impactor coming in, and you can see the resulting cratering. Craters are usually circular because an impact blasts out material in all directions, regardless of the incoming object's direction. Laboratory experiments show that craters are typically about 10 times as wide as, they, uh, as the objects that created them, and about 10 to 20 percent as deep as they are wide. For example, an asteroid one kilometer in diameter will blast out a, cra a crater about 10 kilometers wide and one to two kilometers deep. A large crater may have a central peak which forms from when the center rebounds after impact, in much the same way that water rebounds after you drop a pebble into uh, the surface of water. So the figures here on the right show two impact craters, one on Earth at the top and one on the Moon at the bottom. Details of crater shapes provide clues about geological conditions. For example, this figure contrasts three craters on Mars. The crater in figure one, that on the left, has a simple bowl shape, as we expect from the basic cratering process. The crater in the second figure has an extra large bump in its center and appears to be surrounded by mud flows, uh, suggesting that underground water or ice melted or vaporized on impact. The muddy debris then flowed across the surface and hardened into the pattern that we see today. The crater in figure 3 shows obvious signs of erosion. It lacks a sharp rim and its floor no longer has a well-defined bowl shape. This suggests that ancient rainfall eroded the crater and that the crater bottom was once a lake. Studies of crater shapes on other worlds provide similar clues to their surface conditions and history. Next is vulc uh, volcanism. We use the term volcanism to refer to any eruption of molten lava, whether the lava comes from a tall volcano or simply rises to the surface through a crack in the planet's lithosphere. Volcanism occurs when underground molten rock, typically called magma, finds a path to the surface, as you can see in this little cutout here on the right. 
The same molten rock that is called magma when it is underground is called lava once it erupts onto the surface. Molten rock tends to rise for three main reasons. First, molten rock is generally less dense than solid rock, and lower density materials tend to rise when surrounded by high density materials. Second, because most of Earth's interior is not molten, the solid rock surrounding a chamber of molten rock, that is, a magma chamber, can squeeze the molten rock, driving it upward under pressure. And third, molten rock often contains trapped gases that expand as it rises, which can make it rise much faster and lead to dramatic eruptions. Now, not all volcanoes are the same. We do have several types. So the result of an eruption depends on how easily the lava flows around the surface. Lava that is runny can flow far before it cools and solidifies, while thicker lava tends to collect in one place. Broadly speaking, lava can, ha lava can shape three different types of volcanic features. The runniest lava flows far and, uh, I'm sorry, the runniest lavas flow far and flatten out before solidifying, creating vast volcanic plains. So you can kind of see that here in the left. It looks like a fairly flat region. Magma just comes up to the surface and basically fills up like a pool. Uh, in the middle, with somewhat thicker lavas, they tend to solidify before they completely spread out, creating what we call a shield volcano so named because of their shapes. Shield volcanoes can be very tall, but are not very steep. Examples include the, mountain, the mountains of the Hawaiian Islands on Earth and the Olympus Mons on Mars, which you can actually see here in this figure, this large surface here. The thickest lavas cannot flow very far before they solidify, and therefore they build up tall. Uh, these create steep stratovolcanoes, like you see here with Mount Hood on the right. Examples include Mount Fiji of Japan, Mount Kilimanjaro, um, and Mount Hood in Oregon. Volcanic mountains are the most obvious results of volcanism, but volcanism has had a much more profound effect on our planet. It explains the ex existence of our atmospheres and oceans. Recall that Earth accreted from rocky and metallic planetesimals, while water and other ices were brought in by planetesimals from far more distant reaches of the solar system that crashed into the growing planets. Again, that goes back to our discussion um, during the formation of the solar system where we talked about the snow line, where water could exist and stuff like that. So water and gases became trapped in those interior planets in much the same way that gas in a carbonated beverage is trapped in a pressurized bottle. Volcanic eruptions later released some of this gas into the atmosphere in a process known as outgassing. Outgassing can range from dramatic, as during a volcanic eruption like you see at the top right, to more gradual, as when gas escapes from volcanic vents like you see in the bottom right. The same type of outgassing also occurred on the other terrestrial worlds. That is, virtually all of the gas that made the atmospheres of Venus, Earth, and Mars and the water vapor that rained down to form Earth's oceans originally was released from the planetary interiors via outgassing. All right, our next topic was tectonics. The term tectonics comes from the Greek word tekton for builder. Notice the same root word, uh, notice the same root in the word architect, which means master builder. In geology, tectonics refers to the building of surface features by stretching, compression, or other forces acting on the lithosphere. Tectonic features arise in a variety of ways. For example, the weight of a volcano can bend or crack the lithosphere beneath it, while a rising plume of hot material can push up on the lithosphere to create a bulge. However, most tectonic activity is a direct or indirect result of mantle convection. The crust can be compressed in places where adjacent convection cells push rock together. So you can see that right here on the left of this central image. This type of compression helped create the Appalachian Mountains of the eastern United States. Cracks and valleys, like you see on the right of this middle image, uh, form in places where adjacent convection cells pull the crust apart. Examples of such cracks and valleys include the uh, Guinevere Plains on Venus, uh, the Cer Cerian Valleys on Mars, pardon my pronunciation, 
and New Mexico's Rio Grande Valley. On Earth, the ongoing stresses of mantle convection ultimately fractured Earth's lithosphere into more than a dozen pieces or plates. These plates move over, under, and around each other in a process that we call plate tectonics. The movement of plates explains nearly all of Earth's major geological features, including the arrangement of the continents, the nature of the seafloor, and the origin of earthquakes. Because plate tectonics appears to be unique on Earth, we'll save this for a future discussion. So we'll come back to this when we talk about the Earth in particular. Our last of the four geological processes that shapes um, a planetary surface is erosion. This one's pretty simple. Erosion refers to the simple, uh, I'm sorry, it refers to the breakdown or transport of surface rock through the actions of ice, uh, liquid, or gas. The shaping of valleys by glaciers, uh, the carvings of canyons by rivers, and the shiftings of sand dunes by wind are all examples of erosion. Note that although we often associate erosion with breakdown, it also builds things up such as sand, sand dunes, river deltas, and lake bed deposits. All right, so we'll finish off this lecture with a couple slides discussing how we can relate uh, cratering on a surface to the age of a planet, and this is quite fascinating. It turns out that the smaller the terrestrial world, the less internal heat it is likely to have retained, and thus, the less geological activity it will display on its surface. The less geologically active the world, the older and hence more heavily cratered its surface. This rule means that we can use the amount of cratering visible on a planetary surface to estimate the age of its surface and how geologically active it is. So this is a very important idea, right? So a smaller planet has less internal heat, so we know that it must be less geologically active. Well, if that's the case, it must be older because it's been cooling for a long time. And hence the surface will be more heavily cratered because you won't be seeing volcanoes and things like that reshaping the surface. So. Notice that impact cratering is only one of the four processes with an external cause, it, that being the random impacts of objects from space. This fact leads to one of the most useful insights in planetary geology. We can estimate the geological age of any surface region from its number of impact craters, with more craters indicating an older surface. And by geological age, we mean the age of the surface as it now appears. A geologically young surface is dominated by features that have formed relatively recently in the history of the solar system, while a geologically old surface still looks about the same today as it did billions of years ago. You can understand this idea by thinking about why the moon has so many more impact craters than Earth. We call that all the terrestrial worlds, regardless of their size or distance from the sun, were battered by impacts during the heavy bombardment that occurred early in our solar system's history. Most impact craters were made during that time, and relatively few impacts have occurred since. In places where we see numerous craters, such as on the surface of the moon, we must be looking at a surface that has stayed virtually unchanged for billions of years. In contrast, when we see very few craters as we do on Earth, we must be looking at a younger surface one on which the scars of ancient impacts have been erased over time by geological processes, such as volcanic eruptions and erosion. Careful studies of the moon have allowed planetary scientists to be more precise about surface ages. The degree of crowding among craters varies greatly from place to place on the moon. In the lunar highlands, which is the brighter, higher areas, uh, craters are so crowded that we see craters on top of one another. But in the lunar maria, which happens to be the dark regions that you see, the lower regions, we'll get into this later, um, we only see a few craters on top of generally smooth volcanic plains. Radiometric dating of rocks brought back by the Apollo astronauts indicates that those from the lunar highlands are about 4.4 billion years old, telling us that, they, that the heavy cratering occurred early in the solar system's history, but rocks from the Maria date to 3 to 3.9 billion years uh, ago, telling us that the lava flows that made these volcanic plains had occurred by that time.
Because the Maria contains only about 3% as many craters as the highlands, we conclude that the heavy bombardment phase must have ended by about 4 billion years ago, and relatively few impacts have occurred since that time. So, I just am going to leave you now with a couple interesting slides. So, um, a planet's fundamental properties of size, distance from the sun, and rotation rate are responsible for its geological history. So, these next three slides uh, show the role that each key property, uh, each of those key properties, separately. Um, but a, a planet's overall geological evolution depends on a combination of these three effects. So, we've talked about this one already. The size of the planet matters. Right? So basically, um, if it's smaller, it cools more rapidly, which means there's less geological activity, and then the surface is going to be older, and vice versa. Well, when you talk about distance from the sun, we also mention that at the surface, the sun does affect uh, the temperature. So if you're close to the sun, the surface is too hot for rain, snow, or ices to occur, um, and it allows these gases to escape more easily. So the atmospheres are probably more thin, if at all. Uh, planets at intermediate distances from the sun, like our own Earth, we have everything in moderation. And then planets far away are cooler at the surface, so it can allow for ices and snows to form. Um, that limits erosion, because you won't have any liquid uh, uh, precipitation. Um, atmospheres could exist as well, uh, but they more easily condense to form ices. And we'll see that when we talk about Mars later on, uh, what carbon dioxide does in the atmosphere. And last but not least, rotation. We know rotation uh, is a primary reason for magnetic fields uh, and weather as well. We know most of our weather comes from the rotation of the Earth as well. So basically, slow rotation means less wind and weather and a weak magnetic field. But if you have a stronger rotation, you have more of all of those things. So I just wanted to throw these in at the end for a nice general um, reference. And from this point, we will start to look at a lot more detail and how geology works on each of the different terrestrial worlds. So we'll dig a bit deeper, and then after that, we'll get into the atmospheres. As, for, as always, thanks for watching, and have a great day.